By the time gold prospectors descended on California in the 1840s, the lands of Mexican ranchers and farmers were already being overrun. Although the Treaty of Hidalgo promised to protect land grants from the Mexican and Spanish governments, it wasn't long before white Americans from the east took over those lands for mining, industry, or trade. Within five years of California's statehood, the Anti-Vagrancy Act, also known as the Greaser Act, created a legalized system of discrimination, denied native Californios citizenship, and forced them to pay additional taxes to work in the mining industry. The violence and bigotry was not unlike that experienced by African Americans after Reconstruction under Jim Crow laws. Maceo Montoya writes, To this day, the term Chicano maintains its blurry edges, but continues to reflect a meaningful way of thinking about the confluence of cultural and historical forces, in short, about life. Many Chicanos rejected the term Hispanic due to its connection to Spain. Mexican Americans sought a term that acknowledged their Native American history. Chicano was also valuable as a label that the community gave themselves, versus a term created by Anglos and it provided them a banner to unite under for civil rights and cultural movements. During World War II, tensions ran high between white servicemen stationed in Southern California and local Chicano teens and young men. On May 31, 1943, a fight between Mexican-American youth and U.S. soldiers resulted in retaliation from a contingent of over 50 Navy members. The sailors marched through downtown with makeshift weapons, beating any Chicano youth wearing zoot suits or dressed in attire that identified them as Mexican-American. Other U.S. servicemen joined the riots, expanding their attacks into other areas of metropolitan Los Angeles. Blacks and Filipinos were also attacked by the marauding soldiers. The LAPD joined in the mayhem in support of the military and often arrested the Chicano teens after they had been beaten and stripped of their suits. In response, the city of Los Angeles banned zoot suits, failed to discipline the soldiers, and blamed the problem on juvenile delinquency. Less than a decade later, the U.S. government under Dwight D. Eisenhower initiated Operation Wetback. Although the government had enacted the Bracero program in 1942 to encourage immigration and legal employment of Mexican agricultural workers in response to the widespread shift to manufacturing jobs amongst white Americans, this new program sought to deport these workers back to Mexico. Up to 1.1 million Mexican-Americans were deported between 1954 and 1964 when the program came to an end. Many were gathered up and shipped out despite their families having lived in the southwestern United States since before westward expansion took their ancestral homelands. Service in the U.S. military or existing citizenship was also ignored, demonstrating the universal racism that was widespread against Latinos in the 20th century. In 1962, Cesar Chavez began organizing farm workers from his home in Delano, California. Driving from farm to farm throughout California, he painstakingly recruited thousands of agricultural workers to his fledgling United Farm Workers Union, one at a time. So when we think of the farm worker movement, that's really several movements and labor uprisings that are held particularly in the 30s and in the 60s. And a lot of people recognize names like Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, but it's important to note that these leaders, um, you know, really collaborated with the original farm worker strikers, uh, which were Filipinos uh, from Delano, California, and across the Central Valley, uh, Filipino leaders and elders like Philip Veracruz and uh, Larry Itliong, who would then merge with uh, Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez in the efforts to form the United Farm Workers Union. Chavez and the UFW were only able to promise meager benefits to their new members. What we might take for granted, like safe working conditions and a minimum standard of health and housing, were amongst the initial goals of the union. Fighting on behalf of farm workers to increase wages, dignity, protections, uh, health disparities, uh, use of pesticides, access to bathrooms, water breaks, um, and things that most individuals don't really think about and often take for granted. It's important because when we think about the United States historically, farm workers and domestic workers were excluded from many provisions of labor acts and reforms in the 1930s. Uh, they're not guaranteed a right to overtime, for example, after working 40 hours, and they're not granted the same sort of protections uh, and rights to organize and unionize in the United States. Right? It's only within the last few years that California as a state has now passed a law that will phase in 
farm worker overtime working after 40 hours, you know, and that's only specific to California and other states. It's not the same case. Despite its modest roots, the United Farm Workers Union has grown over 50,000 active members today and continues to support the rights of agricultural workers in California and across the United States. There's a complex history uh, to even the farm worker movement. Cesar Chavez, for example, uh, was known to use terms like wetback, illegals, um, was known for, you know, essentially starting the own UFW border patrol, if you will, um, as he saw strike breakers as, you know, counterproductive to the union's efforts for better wages, etc. And so today, the UFW, however, has, you know, embraced the undocumented community, uh, has moved past uh, those previous perceptions, and now is one of the biggest advocates and proponents for comprehensive and just immigration reform with a path to citizenship for farm workers and undocumented individuals all across the United States. In 1965, Chavez and over 100 Chicano farm workers marched from Delano, California to Sacramento. We got over 100 farm workers gather in Delano and march all the way to the state capitol to march to the governor's office to visit state legislatures and really air their grievances. And this march started with a with 100 people and ended up with thousands of people joining them along the way, meeting them in Sacramento, and really advocating for uh, more just and humane policies towards farm workers. Simultaneously, in March of 1968, students at Lincoln High School in East Los Angeles walked out of their classes. They were joined that day by over 10,000 Chicano students from nearby schools. Mexican-American students were failing out of high school at a staggering rate, and students insisted the district take responsibility for providing adequate opportunities for education that took into account their language and culture, as well as hiring Chicano teachers. Again, law enforcement came down on the protests with a heavy hand, often attempting to incite violence or beating protesters. To their credit, the students proceeded with their march without any major altercations and succeeded in bringing national attention to the failure of the educational system to serve Mexican-American youth. By the late 60s, many of these same students and their family members were being drafted into the military to participate in the Vietnam War. Many Chicanos rejected this requirement to kill and be killed for a war they didn't believe in or for a country that treated them as subhuman. Protests in Chicano communities against the draft were met much as would be expected given the history of the LAPD. Officers beat and killed countless Chicano youth, including the murder of a 15-year-old boy and Los Angeles Times journalist Ruben Salazar while he waited peacefully inside a local bar. The sacrifices made by countless individuals drove the Chicano movement for civil rights in the 20th century, paving the way for other cultural movements in Chicano and Chicana art, literature, music, and community projects. The actions of these brave individuals helped inspire others in the Southwest to demand their own rights be recognized, even in regards to ethnic studies in the 21st century.